Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dorothy Guerrero. I'm Head of Policy in Global Justice Now. And welcome to our Business as Usual Isn't Good Enough um, webinar on why neoliberalism won't help the Global South out of this crisis. So we are doing this um, fortnightly webinar on coronavirus, capitalism, and global inequality. And this is the first of this series. The coronavirus crisis has exposed the inequality of our world. It has also brought people together. And the question everyone is asking is, can the world harness the solidarity displayed over the last few weeks to make real and lasting change for the global south? We know that even without the virus, the business as usual is problematic and that uh, we should not go back to normal when this is over. So we have here joining me tonight are our international panels or panel of speakers to examine what's wrong with the solutions being peddled by the one percent and the alternatives that is um, that is now uh, being um, peddled to us uh, by the mainstream and at the same time we wanted to discuss as well what are the alternatives being proposed especially by our speakers and also proposals coming from the movements so we have uh, three speakers from Ghana, from Ghana, we have um, Jechi Tano, and also joining us live from the Netherlands, Miriam van der Stiekel, and Tim Jones, also in London. So I will introduce them um, more thoroughly later. And at the moment, we, from my screen, I could, I could see that we now have 175 participants. So thank you for, for joining us and giving us your time this evening. So for, uh, for the first input, I would like to call on Jechi Tano uh, to discuss what is happening in Africa and, and also generally in the Global South. Uh, those of you who were with us in the Global Justice Now event, the real trade war last year, uh, would have heard him speak or familiar with him already. And um, he is the head, or Jechi is the head of the Political Economy Unit at the Third World Network Africa. Uh, he's uh, doing research and advocacy on globalization, trade, and development. He's a regular contributor to, to a number of publications on a wide range of subjects relating to globalization in Africa. So, Jechi, I will, I will uh, pass the space to you now uh, to tell us what is happening in, in the Global South generally and also in Africa. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh... Thanks to Global Justice Now for organizing this uh, initiative. Um, obviously, if there's almost 180 people who've uh, tuned in, then uh, you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the timing and the relevance uh, and the importance. Um, just one small correction. I'm uh, no longer with Third World Network Africa, actually. I should have oh. corrected. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm still very close. You can introduce yourself now again. <laughs> I'm, I'm closely associated with them, so that's a minor detail, really. Um, I'm in transition, not in terms of my earthly existence, but in terms of my <laughs> occupation for the time being. You know. But everything else that you said is true, and uh, we, we can kickstart from that point of view. Uh, in terms of what is happening in Africa, obviously, from the point of view of, if we look at it from the global headlines, we all know that uh, it is one of the regions where the outbreak has you know, been slowest in terms of its, uh, its arrival and in terms of its scaling up, in terms of its incidence. And if we look at the official statistics, then in terms of its uh, rate of transmission as well. Having said that, that should give no one any kind of comfort whatsoever, because uh, many countries which followed much later from China, for example, in Italy and Spain and all that, as we know, um, obviously the, it might have started late, uh, the, uh, uh, but once the transition, especially the local transmission uh, took, took off, then it escalated exponentially. And there's no, no reason to think that this, this will not be the experience in uh, Africa or in elsewhere in the global south. Um, just two or three days ago, we crossed in Africa, we crossed the 10,000 infection mark, which for a lot of those who are doing the modeling and so on, uh, it, it implies that the, the, the face of community transmission or local person to person trans, trans, transmission, we are in that, we are just prior to that face, you know. And uh, that is the process by which it starts in terms of one person infecting every three people and that, you know, traveling every two or three days and so on and so forth. And in any case, I think we ought to say that we are not 
100% sure what has happened in Africa and in the global south so far, because uh, there are also indications that the figures could, could already be, be much higher. Um, you know, some of the modeling from places like John Hopkins and so on suggests that probably what is being reported in the official statistics, it might be as low as only 6% of, uh, you know, and that we can't possibly know given the way in which health systems have collapsed, given the way in which, uh, you know, health data collection has, is, is, has been very poor and so on and so forth. And in fact, that is the, the, the business as usual, the reality of business as usual that ought to constitute our starting point in this discussion. We know that uh, in Africa and elsewhere in the global south, much of what passes for, you know, a, a welfare state, if we borrow from that phrase, uh, for, you know, basic thresholds of healthcare, of, uh, you know, public services and so on, have been devastated. And they've been devastated not since yesterday, not since last year, but on an onslaught that has lasted 20, 20 or th going to 30 years now. And that onslaught, of course, started with the imposition of neoliberal economic policies on most of these countries, especially in the case of Africa and parts of Latin America and so on, by the World Bank and the IMF and so on. That whole period of what they call the structural adjustment programs, which was essentially to ensure that uh, those countries which had contracted international debt were able to pay their debt by concentrating their economies on only those focusing on those exports which will generate the foreign exchange for them to pay, pay back their debts. So every other type of expenditure, be it in you know, domestic investment in other, other sectors of the economy or social investment in those social sectors themselves was you know, cut back, was discouraged, and in many cases was decimated. Okay, so we remember, for example, that as recently as uh, six or seven years ago, we saw the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, countries like uh, Sierra Leone, like Guinea, like Liberia, which had never experienced that before were suddenly hit by it. And uh, these were countries which were very ill-prepared precisely because as a result, as a direct result of some of these uh, you know, prior policy impositions that I, I've just referred to. In the case of Sierra Leone, for example, the whole National Health Service had only four ambulances at the time that Ebola hit, okay? Public uh, uh, health workers, had, the numbers of public health workers had been cut drastically because Sierra Leone, as, as with the rest of the Global South, we're being told that your public sector is too bloated. There are too many people employed in your public sector. The numbers ought to be cut. You ought to control the, the, the amount of your public budget going to public expenditure on personnel, on, on public services, and so on and so forth. So you've had this, you know, this wave upon wave of attacks, which has put us in the situation where we are today. And it's not a matter of you know, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, just now. It's, it's a matter, as I said, has been building historically. So we find that we are in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, the average rate of expenditure per capita on health today is $41 per person per year. Okay, now that's probably what, 30 pounds thereabouts? 30 pounds sterling? Your, your bus pass or your London Underground travel card will probably will take care of that in, in a single week, perhaps. Okay, uh, that is what is spent per year per capita per, per, per person. We have about three to four doctors per 10,000 citizens in our, in our economies. And you know the United States, for example, has 240 doctors per 10,000. Okay, granted that majority of those 240 will not be in public health; they'll be in private health. So not that doesn't necessarily indicate that American citizens can access health as easily. Cuba, for example, has 600 um, um, uh, you know doctors to 10,000 people. So again, it's not a matter of simply historic poverty and so on. It is the deliberate choices, the policy, the policy priorities, the values. Which, which govern the use and distribution of public resources and, and, and the development of different capacities and so on and so forth. These are decisive in, 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 this, uh, in, in this case. So we find that even though I, 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 you know, we haven't had the, you know, the epidemic, sorry, the pandemic levels of transmission in terms of locally, I think that that's something that, as I said from the beginning, we cannot discount. In fact, every, every wise uh, approach would be that we ought to expect it and that we ought to move beyond simply trying to quarantine the transmission of, of this, this uh, 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 pandemic through the channels of those who have traveled abroad and so on, which is by and large what has been happening in Africa. Uh, the, the, you know, contact tracing and some degree of isolation has taken place for people who have recently returned from places like Europe. For a long time, it was only to do with people from the East, like China and so on and so forth, because in a sense, that's where everybody thought it came from. But there's also the normal prejudice, you know, yeah, Chinese and so on, versus nice white Northern Europeans who can saunter in and out <laughs> Freely, and, and so on. <laughs> you know, 
so so you have this this type of uh, you know this thing went on for weeks and when the when the final uh, uh, attention was paid to it it's only been paid to trying to isolate you know the the, the, the cases that can be traced connected with those who recently arrived when when the alert were, were, uh, you know became became stronger that is necessary and that is correct but i'm saying that at the same time that must go hand in hand with prevention in terms of a wider spread of local you know a, a, a prevention measures, which includes diagnostics such as testing. There has been very, very little testing in Africa. So when we say we have, you know, in a country like Ghana, we have 330 odd cases with six deaths. I'll tell you the honest truth. We simply do not know. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 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 we, there has been very little by way of ensuring that therapeutics are available as and when, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, people are found to be infected and become ill and need hospital hospitalization or, or care and so on. So the fact that we are doing this piecemeal, that we take care of a selected slice of, trying to contain a selected slice of transmission first, and then we move on hopefully in the future to some kind of wider prevention, preventative measures. And then from there, we move on to diagnostics. From there, we move on to therapy and so on and so forth. What that tells you is that business as usual has not changed. That on the contrary, trying to do this according to a shoestring process where you spend as little as possible on a, on a smaller number of people as possible and trying to get away with it, that's what precisely what is happening. And in the process, the ki kinds of things which are, are, are trying to fill the gap are, is the philanthropy process. So people like Jack Ma, that billionaire, or Bill Gates, donating, what, you know, 20, 200,000 test kits for the whole of Africa, 54 countries. You know, one, it's, it's just unconscionable that first of all, you should have the, necess the ne levels of inequality where 54 countries cannot afford what one or two billionaires can afford to, to do uh, uh, in the world. Or that those 54 countries have to appeal to the IMF and the World Bank and the G20, things that I know Miriam will be and Cole will be talking about, you know, for pitas in terms of, you know, what, what arrangements can free liquidity for them, what arrangements can free extra resources for them by way of, you know, suspension of particular aspects of their debt, not all of their debt in many of the, in many of the cases and, 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 and so on. So when we talk about business as usual, these are the things that are hanging over our head in terms of the, the burdens of not history, long ongoing history, I mean, recent history and also the ongoing realities of a lot of, of, a lot of people in Africa. But there are other aspects to it as well. It's not simply about the kind of you know, uh, you know, uh, policy impositions and so on. It is also the structure of the economy that has been created in the process of ensuring these kinds of debts and so on. Many of you who are involved with global justice now and so on would, uh, would be familiar with the concern that you share with us around the questions of you know, the liberalization of trade to trade agreements to the World Trade Organization and so on. And that kind of liberalization of trade and investment, which has allowed powerful capitalist interests to break up local economies, to enter whichever sector that they want or whichever subsector selectively as they want so that they can integrate their profit making on a, glo on a, profit -making on a global scale, exploit the cheapest labor from location to location pay no tax, you know, uh, uh, pay no, no living wage, and so on and so forth. That has proliferated in a, in a way that has ensured that the dependence of African countries on exploiting natural resources, on deforestation, on, on pumping out commodities that uh, pollute the environment, and so on, or on destroying the natural uh, habitat of many, uh, you know, uh, 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 wildlife that come closer and closer into contact with human beings and so on. The same trends in agribusiness, global agribusiness, that we see in terms of the mass production of animals and so on, you know, we find those things also happening in places like Af Africa. We, we find, you know, Ebola, for example, was a result of another avian bat-related transmission through a variety of inter intermediaries to a human population at a time when deforestation in Africa, you know, was at record levels, and it still is at record levels. I mean, last year, for example, if you take the World uh, Institute for Resources, their annual count about rates of deforestation in the world, the, out of the top 10 countries that were, you know, uh, doing the fastest deforestation in the world, seven were Africa. Ghana, my country where I'm speaking from now, was number one, 60% rate of increase in its levels of deforestation. A country following that number two is a country next door, Ivory Coast, which along with Ghana has some of the highest mm -hmm. incidence of COVID-19 as we speak right now, and will probably be one of the, the hotspots in terms of its, its explosion and, 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 and so on and so forth. We find the same things going on in, in country after, uh, after country. And that dependence on that raw material has been accentuated precisely by the process that I described earlier. The need to concentrate on export earnings that can yield enough for you to pay your debts, that can yield enough for you to uh, have a currency uh, uh, reserves 
that will make you look creditworthy and be attractive to foreign financial speculators to come and buy your domestic bonds, to come and buy your debt, to get a good credit rating from you know, the credit rating agencies and from the IMF and the World Bank and so on and so forth. That is the sick logic of business as usual that we continue to do today. But as I said, in the process, the structure of our economy, the ability of our, the circuits of our economy to support each other have broken down. We all know from what we see now, the current ongoing experience, that the, one of the greatest threats to the global economy is the breakdown of circuits of supply, you know, so-called so global supply chains, okay? Because you have production situated in one place, inputs coming from another place, supplies and final consumer markets elsewhere and so on. And the more elongated that these supply chains become, the more prone they are to sudden shocks, sudden disasters. But also the more prone they are to, you know, political power play, because precisely because of that threat, powerful governments, powerful firms will do everything possible to suppress rival claims to suppress, you know, within that chain and control and exercise monopoly uh, authority, even to, to, with the use of state power in terms of you know, trade wars and sanctions and uh, you know, policies that are binding and, and, and so on and so forth. So if you find this, uh, that, that this is already imperiling the global economy as a whole, this type of supply chain network, how about situations where in entire countries and in entire regions and entire continents, the things that bind local economies together have been tattered 10,000 different ways. The problem that we face in Africa is the, the utter fragmentation of our economies in the process of, that we become more integrated into the global economy. Now, this is not inevitable. Let me use China as an example. In 2011 or 2012 thereabouts, sorry, 2010, 2011 thereabouts, China became the biggest exporter in the world, okay? And China's role and position in global trade has grown since then. But China's role and position in global trade has grown at the same time as the share of international trade in the Chinese economy is falling. In other words, the China's economic, domestic economic growth and the interconnectedness of that domestic economic growth is growing at a faster pace, pace and it's, out, it's outpacing even its record growth uh, you know, performance in international trade. It is the opposite in Africa. Mm -hmm. We okay. find that the more we become dependent on global commodity chains, on global export markets, on global finance, the less we are able to finance our own development, to finance even small family farms, let alone the big uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, t technological clusters that can serve as you know, points of intermediation, points of aggregation, points of integration of our different economies and so on and so forth. We don't have any of that. So when you have a situation where you have a breakdown like you have today, you have people who historically, because of cheap imports subsidized, for example, from the European Union, farm produce, 60% of farm produce rots on the farm in the most food insecure parts of the world like in Africa. Already mm -hmm. Yeah, let me stop you there, Jechi, because I know that some of those um, points will come out in our question and answer. I would like to remind all the speakers that this whole webinar will be in 90 minutes and um, all the first presentation, uh, we're giving 10 minutes to each speaker so that we can have uh, several rounds of Q&A afterwards. So, yeah, sorry, you... I, I, was, I wasn't paying attention to <laughs> If <laughs> okay, I may so quickly round speakers, off. Yeah, please look at the chat as well. Yes, so yes, uh, thank you, uh, Jechi, for pointing out that one, you know, the interconnectedness, the global interconnectedness that we have now is different from, let's say, when previous pandemics and epidemics happened. And then this, um, the global scale of this uh, pandemic is, is really uh, quite massive. And at the same time, the economic impacts, which will be felt, especially by developing countries, will also be massive. That the, the economic effects of the last economic crisis 10 years ago, no, 12 years ago, the 1998, 1999, will look like a walk in the park compared to the impacts of this economic crisis. So we will go back to those points and also uh, those points that you raised about the wrong priorities, policies, and um, what governments are giving up and in, in, in their choices of the policies, economic policies that they are taking. So I would now want to move to our second speaker, Miriam van der Stikel. Is, um, many of you would know her from her work on global finance, financial reform, free trade agreements, and all those um, exciting and, and very, very complex issues. Miriam is a senior researcher at the Center for Research on Multinational Corporations, or SOMO, based in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And uh, she's joining us live from the Netherlands. So Miriam has uh, recently developed the idea of a Corona survival tax as an alternative 
um, and how we can get out of uh, of, of, of a way to get out of this crisis and and uh, what a, pan a post pandemic world we, we would want it to be. So this kind of alternative is something that's much needed now. So Miriam, maybe you can explain to us what is this Corona Survival Tax and how will it work? So good evening, everybody. Um, basically, um, this is kind of one of the proposals of what needs to be done. And especially, um, I want to elaborate, you know, the why of this, this tax, because it also links with uh, what uh, Cheche has been saying. Um, because I don't know if you've also had the feeling like why on earth for the moment the governments have to, you know, pay all these, uh, come up with all the money and uh, probably the, the real money is somewhere else. Um, and, you know, how is it that we said the market would solve everything and know that the markets have to come up with the financing, they're crashing down. Um, but I think it also links very much with kind of channels of inequality that has been going on for quite some while, for quite a time, um, and that I think we have to tackle. So um, I would say this Corona survival tax is like a short term measure, but also very much to educate people, you know, we cannot let all the governments um, pay for it. But of course, it's also a way to say, where are the things that are going wrong? so that we, we don't and we stop all this interconnectivity. Um, so as, as Chichi has been saying, you know, this is really increasing inequality and exploiting uh, developing countries. Um, so um, basically, as you have heard, you know, even the government now was a pause <clears throat> in the UK has promised to have 45 billion of pounds in kind of ways to help the economy and people and et cetera. And um, what is not being said is where will that money come from? Um, although I think today there was another discussion now in the UK, but even in the, uh, in the EU, in the, in the US, uh, in other countries, um, certainly also developing countries, if they want to kind of pump up this money, this is very often money that is going to be debt that will be kind of put in the, the financial markets, very often as in bonds. So kind of a contract that you say, I'll borrow so much for you and I will pay you back at so much. Um, and basically these bonds are then being bought by rich individuals and they will have to be paid back. So that means basically it's taxpayers' money that will have to pay for the debt in many countries. Just today, the uh, central bank of the UK has said, well, probably we will buy it, which is quite new and in many countries uh, not acceptable, certainly not in Europe with the European Central Bank. The other problem is that there's very little conditions attached. You will get aid, but you know, what does it mean? What are you going to do? Is it going to be um, to really help the poorest people? Um, will it be for activities that are not, are not kind of increasing climate change and so on? So basically you see that the market solutions are not, um, are, are not working for the moment. Um, and the state is coming in. And Sam, if you can put the, um, the slide with the, um, with the, um, because the, one of the slides that I wanted to share is that indeed we know and we heard, you know, there's a, the, the markets have crashed and you can see it is going down. Um, and basically what we don't have to think about is that it's just the money evaporated, as they're saying. No, a lot of these investors who have invested in all kinds of uh, markets, market products, they are sitting on their cash and that cash is sitting, is sitting aside. Um, and the, the cash basically comes from investing in all those years. This is um, a, a graph that starts in 2017 and you see how it has been going up. And that's something I wanted to talk about um, because this graph going up means that, you know, more and more investors were able, the more money you have, the more you were able to invest, the more money you were able to get as a return. Um, and basically one of the reasons why these um, values of in financial markets were coming up is because the multinationals were paying like one trillion in dividends just to say, you know, how much money is already being spent in 2018, 2019 to the rich people. But in order to increase those, um, the, the, sh the value of the shares and the bonds, they were buying back, the multinationals were buying back 1.5 trillion of shares. So this went all kind of back to the rich people. The big banks themselves, for instance, spent 302, 
325 billion dollars in sharebacks and dividends just in in one year last year um, because they made huge profits just the biggest bank for instance made 36 billion of profits and 12 percent and so on so basically what it means is that um, especially also the banks, if they make so much profit, they are giving it to the rich, but they also are extracting it from companies, from workers, also from the environment. Um, and at the same time, they're not paying taxes. I, I looked at some, at some of them and the average tax rate is 20%. So which is not enough to really kind of ensure that public financing is there sufficiently for public uh, services. So the next slide, um, I would like to show that basically, some if you can get me the, the, the next slide. Um, basically, what happens is that the um, prices and the spending for the going to the shares, uh, share buyback, etc. Sam, would you be able to give me the other slide, please? Slide number six. Probably not. Basically, there's a big difference between the prices of the shares going up and the wages just remaining stagnant. Uh, no, it's the one before. Yeah. Isn't it this one here? Yeah, this one, exactly. Yeah. So, and that's basically why there are so many people who have so little financial means to survive currently because they have been exploited. You know, there has been, there has been a lot of flex labor, etc. Um, and that's because of, you know, how a lot of the, the share owning and the bond owning has been, uh, has been evolved. Um, and basically what you see is that <clears throat> there, a lot of people have been playing on these markets and they have been earning a lot of money just by speculating uh, on lowering prices on, and that also has contributed to the financial crash, crash for the moment, just kind of by speculating on lowering prices. It, it, in technical terms, it means short selling. But also um, they are making a lot of money by computerized trade that has been going on for years, uh, trading in nanoseconds, day trading and so on. It has nothing to do with saying, okay, I'm going to invest in a company that is worthwhile, but it's making money by, by money. And this is possible because it's very badly regulated. It's allowed to do this kind of speculative stuff. And of course, that means there has been a lot of lobbying that allows that to do. But that means a lot of money is just spent not on society. Um, and also there have been quite some investment products that made it easy to invest. But those who are owning those shares, the big asset managers such as BlackRock, they have been voting uh, at the company's annual meetings against uh, what the against um, measures that would um, ensure that those companies are not changing climate change are not exploiting their workers um, and that's an, an important issue to show how the dynamics it's not only about the, the share markets etc but it's also very much about you know what is happening behind it and why is it that it goes so much up and for the moment up and down very much, as you can see. I mean, even if the, the US situation is getting worse, um, the shares, the, the, sh the stock markets are going up. So it has nothing to do with what is really happening. The other issue is that, of course, um, the investors and the speculators, they were very interested also to go into where they could get a lot of money. So they also very much uh, were buying up shares and, and bonds from developing countries, but they knew it was very risky. And as soon as they thought that perhaps there would be a problem of repaying those and the, the value might go down, they have been fleeing. So in March, they have been, uh, there has been an outflow uh, from those uh, investors of 83.3 billion uh, from developing countries uh, just in March 2020. The problem is that that means that there was a depreciation of the, um, of, the, of the currency of those countries and that makes it extremely difficult to repay their debt. But I think Tim will, will touch on that so I don't say much more. But like by the end of, two, seven, by the end of this year, they will have to repay $730 billion back but it will be extremely expensive. So um, some of you could then uh, look at my slide where I show that uh, one of the kind of easy to invest products um, for, from developing countries with kind of debt and bonds from developing countries, it also crashed dramatically. 
and basically that is a kind of debt that should not be repaid. Um, but just to show how quick you can go in and out in one minute if you want. And that's something that is extremely badly regulated, but that is basically, they were very eager, as we have seen in the case of Ghana, where these investors were very eager to get like a bond from Ghana, where you have like 8.7, 95% of interest rate. And then of course, as soon as you think, well, probably it's not so profitable as I thought, you can, you can sell it with the consequences uh, for, these, for these countries. So, the thing is that it's not only that in the past, before the crisis, that the, the wrong things were happening, but also now. For instance, I just found out that the biggest oil companies were able to get 32 billion in the recent weeks, even uh, last week, just as, uh, as investors wanted to put some money in there, even up to 2015. So it means, you know, climate change, they don't care. And some of the hedge funds have been making 50% of profit, just speculating on the oil prices or on dividend pays or going on, the markets going up and down. Uh, there were like 6 billion put in such one of such speculative products. So basically it's badly regulated, but what is what it is about, it's the money is not going where it should. And there's no way that the government should kind of come up with money. And then these kind of things can continue and we don't get that money. And therefore, my proposal is to have a corona survival tax, which is in a, a, a very short term measure to get those to make sure that that money is not going to those speculators or those short term investors, uh, which just don't do anything but just um, use their money. So what my proposal is, um, and some can probably also put a slide there, is first of all, to make sure that all those speculative players are being um, kind of are being taxed, um, that they also the stock markets who make profit out of it, that they are being taxed, um, that all those providers of these easy short term uh, investment products like BlackRock, who was making five billion almost in profits, you know, that they are being taxed much, much higher than they are now. Um, also the too big to fail banks who are stimulating all of this, um, the large companies in stock markets who have been buying up uh, their own shares who have been giving all these dividends. We don't want to pay them to pay dividends. And of course, all the wealthy individuals and investment officers. So it's basically, I mean, there's lots of money, no money even going to the absolutely to the wrong place. That's what we need to tax now. And I don't kind of put it as a very progressive tax. I say, make sure that they're being taxed up to up to 35% from their actual low level tax level in the very short term to make sure that it is really going very quickly. I don't say this is a long-term tax. Um, and it could be managed by the home and the host tax authorities. Um, and so that you know the, the, the tax collection can happen very often because some of these dividends are being paid even quarterly. Um, if there might be some exemptions in the sense of, okay, if you are paying, paying no bonuses, you don't share, you don't, uh, pay your tax, your uh, shares back. You pay dividends um, only if you really don't pay off your people. You reduce the top management pay. You pay all your suppliers. If you have something left, then yes, please, we will tax you. Um, the same for the banks. They really have to have a condition that if ever you don't want to pay the tax, you really have to make sure that all your clients and small and medium-sized enterprises are being served and their debt being canceled and the same for developing and also the debt of developing countries. And of course, there should be no tax dodging. And this tax income should go to the health services, but also, and that's, and it can be part, be part of the campaign, certainly also for developing countries because they won't be able to repay your tax, their tax as you will hear, but they need, of course, to restructure their economies. And that's also what we heard from Chicha just now. I mean, that means kind of restructuring investment in different ways of um, organizing your government. So, Good morning. So um, that's basically where I was saying, you know, we need this Corona survival tax, the money is there. And of course, there's also kind of um, other issues that need to be done. I mean, this is one of the measures, but there's also 
uh, making sure that there's the speculating is stopping and uh, some countries have done that uh, that you really manage your capital flows that the you know the suffering from developing countries just because the money is going out is stopped that called that is called capital controls that you stop this kind of very short trading which is called the financial transaction tax in the uk it's called the robin hood tax um, and you make sure that there's no money going in and out of the tax havens. So this is very short term. That's what is needed now. So it's not only saying the government has to print all the money or we have to make the developing countries suffer. Um, but of course, in the long term, it's like never again would we learn to have uh, all this money sloshing around in the wrong ways, um, not serving society. Uh, it really has to, there should be a prohibition of financing anything that is changing the climate or which is socially responsible uh, towards the north, but also in the, towards developing countries, uh, because there's a lot of investment is going there. Um, of course, there's a lot of um, prohibition of the current activities uh, that I just described that needs to be happening. And then, of course, you have to introduce progressive taxes on the wealthy, on the corporations, um, so that inequality is really re being reduced. And closing the tax havens is, of course, um, quite important. So, um, but one of the other things is that it is important for people to raise their voices. Tax the rich, we don't want them to hear. Um, we have to stop the lobbying, which allowed this badly regulated financial system to allow the money to go to the wrong places. Um, and therefore it's very important, like people like you are raising your voices and saying, we know where the money is, that's where you have to get it. So that's it for me for the moment. Um, and kind of uh, hoping uh, that you have find it an interesting idea. And But it's also kind of, you know, what do we do in the short term? What do we do in the long term? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne. That's, that, that was excellent. And I'm sure I, from the chat, I could see a lot of support and a lot of people getting excited about um, taxing the speculators. And, uh, and, and I think it is indeed uh, important that you mentioned that even if we are staying home, we should not be silent. We should campaign on this. And I'm sure in the questions, we can, there will be how to do it, how we can push this, and all those. So thank you very much again for that. So our, our last um, speaker is Tim Jones. And um, from, I think many of you know him uh, from his work with the Jubilee Debt Campaign, where he leads the policy team in the campaign to cancel the, global, the, the debt to the Global South. We are also co-running a campaign, uh, which you can also see in our, in our website. And I think uh, Sam will, will put the, We'll put the link on the chat. So we are saying that um, the UN is also uh, is already uh, calling that this crisis um, will be the biggest challenge for the world and especially for those countries that are that are poor and in the globe in, in, in the global south. Um, just merely addressing the the pandemic are cost will cost them a lot and. On top of that, they are also allotting. Up, um, there's a there's an automatic appropriation for for debt repayment. So so that will be a big problem. So we are calling on the UK uh, government um, to join with other um, rich countries to to at the tempora, to at the moment to to stop uh, and, and have a debt cancellation and, and, and for for the, for the poor countries to stop uh, paying the debt. So team, uh, can you tell us more and explain the campaign as well? Hi everyone, it's great to be with you uh, this evening. So yes, I'm Tim from Jubilee Debt Campaign in the UK and we were already facing a large scale debt crisis across much of the global south at the start of this year, even before we knew anything about the virus. Over the last 10 years, there's been a huge buildup in debt. So since the financial crisis in the Western world, interest rates have been at record lows. And that means speculators have been looking to lend at higher interest rates in the global south. So there has been a big boom in lending. And as Jetche was saying, we've um, also seen the... Um, 
countries in the global south have remained dependent on commodities, raw materials for their exports. Uh, this goes back to colonial times, um, but the, um, there are many problems with um, commodities. They vary wildly in price. Their income from them can be captured easily by elites and multinational companies. And with um, these commodities, a few years ago in 2014, the price of them fell and countries resorted to even more borrowing to cope with that. So at the start of this year, there were already well over 30 countries that were in debt crisis, many where go um, they were, governments were spending over 20 or 30 percent of their revenue on debt payments. And in such countries, their um, public spending was already falling in order to try and pay those debts. And on, it is that situation that now the coronavirus crisis has come into. And um, we, we have seen this huge economic shock has hit countries through the fall in, further fall in commodity prices, through this huge um, capital flight out of countries, speculators taking money and moving it back to places that they think are safe um, in um, the Western world. And that has then pushed up the, either the potential cost of countries to borrow or more likely just that governments in the global south will no longer be able to borrow on financial markets. So we, uh, Jubilee Debt Campaign, and along with organisations we work with, like Global Justice Now, have been calling for debts to be cancelled in the face of this crisis. And these calls have actually started um, to get some attention in the international community. So next week, there will be meetings to discuss um, various options as to what can be done about the debt. Now to um, this, um, we've been campaigning for it, but it's also been a call from debtor governments. So a couple of weeks ago, African finance ministers issued a call for suspension of all interest payments this year. Particular governments such as Ethiopia, Ghana, Pakistan have been very outspoken in saying that debt payments need to be written off entirely. It's best to think about debt in three different groups. So the um, governments tend to owe debt outside their country to three groups. The first is to other governments, which includes Western governments, but also um, countries like China. And what has happened there is that the IMF and World Bank, the two international major, um, big major institutions, have called for those debt payments to be suspended. And the, those negotiations are happening now, but it might be that um, next week um, governments agree to um, suspend the debt payments of um, 76 most impoverished countries uh, to other governments. The, that will save those countries money now. The trouble with it is that it is only a suspension, it's not cancelling the payments and so they will then um, become due to be paid in the future and just create a much bigger debt problem further down the line. The next group of people that debt is owed to is the multilateral institutions themselves, the IMF and World Bank. And while the IMF and World Bank have said other people should cancel their debt, they've been less forthcoming on the debt that's owed to them. So the IMF is potentially cancelling a, um, a small amount, about a billion dollars of payments over the next six months. And the World Bank so far has not agreed to do anything. But they are big creditors and at the moment a lot of money is due um, to go to them. And then the third group, which is really important and that um, Miriam has been highlighting, are the private banks and speculators who hold the highest interest debt. And this is debt that is, um, weirdly, it's traded every day on financial markets. And we, what happened um, when the crisis began is that these speculators started selling off this debt and moving it, um, the money back um, 
into the, um, their home countries. And so that means the value of it has fallen. So at the moment, Zambia, for example, a um, hundred dollars of its debt you could buy on a financial market for thirty dollars and the people who are buying that are um, some of um, what we call vulture funds um, in, um, speculators who specialize in buying up debt when it's cheaply and then when it's cheap and then um, trying to sue and get big profits on that debt and make a huge profit on it and there is a scandalous danger at the moment that there are these kinds of speculators that could make huge, huge profits out of this crisis if that debt ends up being paid. So we're also campaigning to support um, governments who want to stop paying and for measures to make it easier for them to stop paying those debts. So in the UK, we, um, I know not everyone on the call is in the UK, but the UK is crucial to this because most international debt contracts are owed under UK law. So it's the UK Parliament decides legally how they're dealt with. So the UK could pass legislation to say vulture funds cannot sue countries because of stopping paying debts during this crisis. And that would have a major impact on enabling countries to stop paying and to protecting them from um, being sued by these vulture funds. So at um, Jubilee Debt Campaign and Global Justice Now, uh, we have a petition to the UK government calling for these kind of actions to help countries stop pay their debts. And then the meetings that will be discussing this are on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday next week. On Tuesday, we've agreed globally a mass day of action where we're going to highlight the need to drop the debt, to cancel the debt, um, in response to the crisis. So you'll um, be getting information from Jubilee Debt Campaign or Global Justice Now if you're um, subscribed to our list. But on Tuesday, we want everyone to be posting on Twitter, on social media, using the hashtag cancel the debt so that we can make put, uh, the pressure we can from our homes out to um, those um, leaders while when they're making their um, discussions next week. So I'd really encourage you to get um, involved with that. At the moment, it feels like it is a time when major significant changes um, could happen. And that so um, from our homes, we can raise our voices and try and make some of those things happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, team. Those are excellent. And, and as he mentioned, for those who are subscribed to, to both um, Jubilee Debt Campaign and Global Justice Now, you'll get your emails. And also, if you're not, uh, you can also tune in and, and, and pay attention to the, the Twitter, to our Twitter and Facebook pages and all other social media and help us by retweeting and tweeting uh, what we will do on that day of action. Uh, there are some questions now. So what I would like to do is uh, we have about, uh, give or take, we still have an hour for questions. So I hope that we can do at least three or four rounds of questions. But majority of the questions also is no, um, asking whether they could download Miriam's um, um, presentation. Yes, uh, I, I saw from my email that she already sent it to us so we can share them with you. And, and, and you, can, uh, you can have um, a copy of those, uh, of that, of, of those uh, slides that, that she shared. Uh, I will maybe read or, or, or um, mention maybe three or four questions directed to our panelists. So one is from Ronald Mendel from Bristol. Um, he said that um, the, trade, the TUC or Trade Union Congress in England today called on debt relief for countries in the global south and the suspension on conditionality imposed by the IMF and the World Bank. So however, given the go it alone approach to the pandemic taken by the US, the UK and the EU and the lack of solidarity with the global north, what are the prospects that significant measures will be taken to assist the global south to cope with the impact of the pandemic? And then there's also a question from Ron, um, might a realistic Tobin tax not be? 
there are also, there's also a similar question coming from um, Michael Gallant. At least in the past, capital controls that would have, or comment as well, would have helped with speculative outflows were largely banned by conditions of IMF loans. The IMF has changed its tune somewhat, but do those restrictions still exist? If global South countries want to institute capital controls, do they face challenges in doing so far? So maybe I'll, I'll stop with those three questions and comments and then uh, give a chance to our panelists to respond to those. And as I mentioned, keep your questions coming. Um, we're receiving it here. And also you can post uh, comments on the chat. So who wants to? I don't know if Tim wants to start with yeah, maybe Tim uh, to our directed at you. Probably. Look, well, I can say something a bit on the global north and how much they will act. Um, but I think definitely Miriam and Jetche are probably better than me on capital controls. Um, I, it's great that the um, TUC have said that. I've not actually seen that. Um, we've got um, organizations across the world, across sectors that are getting involved in the call for dropping the debt. And so it's, um, that's great to see that. Um, obviously, we have a problem in many countries in the global north about their lack of solidarity. And sometimes it's hard to be hopeful in the face of that. And some of the amounts of money that are needed are just a tiny fraction of the money that the Bank of England or the European Central Bank or the US Federal Reserve are um, creating at the moment. And so it can be a bit disheartening thinking of it like that. But um, what we do know is on the debt side, this um, we both the combined efforts of the borrowers speaking out, and I think campaigners supporting them around the world has got the issue on the agenda. And the thing with debt is that borrowers always have power because they can just choose not to repay. There are um, difficulties with that, and we can talk through some of those if anyone wants to ask in the questions, but that forces the Global North to listen because the Global South can just stop paying and um, that then impacts on the um, hedge funds and the banks uh, in the Global North. So because of that power, that is how these it can be put on the agenda and um, how we can try and force some solidarity uh, out of um, leaders in the global north. Yeah, um, I just also saw the question, can you please explain uh, capital controls before you start talking about it? Um, basically, that's what I wanted to say when I say managing the money going in and out. Um, you know, it's kind of, making sure that those flows in and out are not happening. And you can do that in different ways. Um, for instance, Chile had for a long time um, a tax that if you were withdrawing money that was not um, staying more, that was staying less than one year, you would have to tax it. Um, so there are also ways that you can distinguish between kind of speculative money that comes in very short term, uh, but you would allow for kind of transactions or kind of payments for um, trade or for long term uh, direct investment that you would allow that, but you really tax what is going in and out. Um, there are also very sophisticated ways. Some of the central banks intervene in the foreign exchange market because that's where the speculation is happening. Um, this kind of thing. I always call them smart capital controls because there are different ways you can do it sometimes with very complex instruments with the current kind of badly regulated um, for an exchange market where a lot of speculation is taking place. The thing is indeed that for a long time, the, w, the IMF has said that you're not allowed until you have everything in order in your economy. And now recently they have seen that, of course, if you have all these speculators coming in and out, that has nothing to do with your economy. And they made a mistake with Argentina where they were giving 44 billion in, aid, in grants and not in grants, sorry, sorry, in loans to Argentina and in the shortest uh, time possible, 33 billion were getting out because they didn't impose uh, 
that one of the conditions would be that capital would not be allowed to flow out and that and and, and therefore argentina is in the, in a big problem again for a long time so that certainly means if we have that release and that kind of cancellation that has to go otherwise you yeah there's an expression in the netherlands where you say you're you're cleaning with the tap open um in the sense from you know you have to make sure that the money that is being saved is not going to the private debtors or to, to speculators. So that's why you would also need to have this uh, management. The, the country, some countries have been afraid because of these, all these investors and speculators, they don't like it because then they can't get out. Um, and they basically say, if you do that, we won't come in. Um, but actually they still do if they see a lot of profits. Um, and actually it is also in their, in their advantage um, that if the money doesn't kind of with the value of the of the currency is not changing so quickly. Um, then the other question is, shouldn't it be, my, the corona survival tax, shouldn't it be long term? I think in principle, yes. And that should be then worked out much better than what I do now. But this is like a short term tactical thing. You know, people would now accept it much more. That's basically what I'm trying to do. It's two things, accepting that you have to tax them. And secondly, um, you know, to show where the money is going wrong. But indeed, that's what I was trying to do at the end. Yes, we, we need much more long-term measures um, that all these um, kind of undue profits are not going um, to, un, yeah, to people who don't kind of use it for, for society. Um, and in that sense, also a Tobin tax or a financial transaction tax, you know, against anything that is kind of very short term transactions would also be part of the, um, of the, of the proposals. Um, so I think, um, yeah, that's basically, and then of course, there was also a question from Neil. Um, where he was saying, for the moment, the, probably the, the property owners will also be supported. I think actually what we need, if we have money for the people, we should allow people to buy their houses. And a lot of these property owners have also a lot of uh, shares or funding through the market. Um, you know, they should not, they should be able, they should be, if they tax, they will have to sell their houses and then people should be able to buy them up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jechi, do you yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, the others have spoken very well about how destabilizing, you know, hot money can be. Money that comes into your country chasing after high price, uh, you know, financial securities or to get involved in making a quick buck and then going out again. It can be very destabilizing for a small economy. The volumes of the money can be very big. They push up local prices, including, you know, or can crash your local currency when they go out or can inflate it when they come in. And if you are an exporter, a, a primary a raw, mat raw material or agricultural exporting country, the value of your currency goes up, your exports become more expensive, you, get, you can sell less. At the same time, when all the money goes out, your money crashes, the imports that you depend on for, for fundamental medicines or for machinery, the, the prices go higher, the servicing of your foreign debt goes higher and so on. So by and large, I think those who've spoken about that destabilization are absolutely important. And, any mechanism or any measure that in the public interest or due to particular developmental or welfare goals, governments take to slow down, limit, prohibit that kind of volatile and destabilizing movement, which is what Miriam means by capital controls, all those things are very welcome. But we face a challenge, two challenges in fact. And if we're talking about moving away from business as usual, then I think we ought to go beyond simply how do you restrain what already exists? Because what already exists is itself problematic in many ways. Even if there was not hot money, it will still be problematic for countries of the global south or countries of Africa that they are so highly dependent on foreign finance and foreign capital. That will be a problem in any way, in any case. So while we're at it, I agree with Miriam's proposition that we look at the short term and we combine that with the long term as well. We need to think about you know, the next steps in a variety of different integrated, integrated systemic ways uh, uh, effectively. So yes, we can raise taxes on money coming in, a, in and out. We can raise, uh, you know, so on. But the key thing for me, I think, is the power and space for public authorities and for public policy in the global south to claim some of the policy space back. For example, one of the reasons why hot money moves into Africa and out of Africa is if you take, let's say in Britain, for example, interest rates are very low at the moment. Interest rates in Africa are very high to attract precisely the interest of foreign investors to come into the country, okay? 
for that same reason, foreign investors can come into the country, but no local business can borrow because the local interest rates are too high. If governments have the power to press down interest rates or to have development banks or other financial means that can deliver badly needed credit so that production in key supplies, whether it's to deal with the, the, the COVID-19 uh, um, um, immediate emergencies like face masks or other equipment, whether it's to do with food shortages, those things should be able to recapitalize straight away. And therefore, the room for governments to create credit as well as spend money directly has to be part of the kind of series of considerations that we take on board immediately. I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very, very, very vital thing, which then will allow itself that speculation to slow down. Because if you take the case of borrowing, let's say in Britain for, for next to nothing and coming to turn around that money in a couple of weeks in a place like Ghana for 14, 15% on interest rates, what you call carry trade, borrowing cheap and, you know, and, 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 and you know, l l l l l lending high, you, you begin to limit that kind of, uh, you know, uh, thing as well. The same capacity of governments to regulate the price of credit, to its generation, its distribution, how you proliferate it, how you guide it, how you selectively distribute it one way and so on and so forth. Those same capacities come with the capacity to regulate foreign direct investment in a variety of different ways. It comes with the capacity to limit volatile capital flows like the private equity and portfolio funds and so on and so forth. In Africa, for example, if you take, let's say, a country like Nigeria, Nigeria is the biggest country in Africa, the biggest economy in, in, in Africa. Foreign direct investment since uh, 2018 has fallen by 9%. Speculative flows like this private equity has grown by between three and 5,000%. Now, clearly, clearly, that can't be allowed to be sustained. And when you have a panic moment like this, that process is actually accelerated. So I'm saying that the capacity, the necessity of linking the day-to-day, -day, the business as usual, with the panic moments of extreme heightened tension like now, that correlation is very important. And regaining some sovereignty and control over monetary policy, over, uh, over uh, exchange rates, over ability to tax, over the ability to uh, uh, invest and ensure that they're subsidized or direct public investment. I think all those things are necessary. And a lot of people think that poor countries actually are not in a position to do so. I think it's wrong. And that's why I was trying to say from the beginning that one of the challenges our economies face is the way in which different sectors of our economy or subsectors of our economy no longer constitute markets for one another, okay? If you're an agricultural producer, you can't sell because foreign rice and foreign poultry is coming into the country, okay? The economic partnership agreements, for example, ensured that the poultry industry in Africa was co collapsed. Netherlands, where Miriam is from, okay? You have people where, who have poultry outgrowers in Ghana today. That means it's not simply about cocoa and coffee and agricultural outgrowers where you have contract farmers. You have poultry farms who have imported chicks and feeds and chemicals and so on from the Netherlands, producing under the same conditions that produces all these avian flus everywhere else in the world. It all the, under less regulated conditions, cheaper industries, lower environmental standards, and so on and so forth. So I'm saying we need the systemic things that interlink the financial and monetary interventions with the public health interventions, with the public investment in and the production capacity interventions as well, which will, which will uh, balance some of these things out. Without that, without that, we have the financial dependence, which makes the debt solidarity difficult. I think the comrade from uh, Jubilee is, is perfectly right when he speaks in terms of what is required from the global north. What is required from the global south is for people to stick together in a unified position, which is so difficult because countries have different credit ratings they have different access to international markets. They want to protect that access. In fact, they compete to have higher or less, to be a more attractive destination or not with, with, with each other. And so in as much as they may want particular types of debts to be canceled or interest payments to be suspended, they are also worried about the, what for them is the bottom line. Will this affect my credit rating, for example? I mean, it's, it's, it's a very important consideration. Secondly, these things don't affect everybody ev evenly. When it comes to interstate debts, all we have to understand is that for years and years and years, the countries of the global north have lent less and less and less to countries of the global south. It is those who have been used, who have to provide credit as part of their new expansion into the global south, like China, are those who actually have lent more and more in terms of interstate government to government debt. So when people want to privilege governments canceling debt uh, to, to one another, in a sense, it's also a form of China bashing. Okay, I'm not saying China shouldn't cancel debt. Of course, by all means, they should. But we shouldn't let the countries of the global north use this hypocritically and get away with certain things. Mm -hmm. Neither should we let the IFIs get away with this because if you take the IFIs again, that same unity is not present. The guy mentioned, the, sorry, is it Tim or Tom? Sorry, Tim, Tim. 
Tim, pardon me. I, Tim was correct to mention the fact that 76 of the poorest countries stand to gain from some degree of debt relief, whether it's suspension, whether it's you know, more special drawing rights, whatever, it, whatever you know, for formulations are, are brought to bear. These 76 countries, let's say if you take West Africa, the region where I'm in, almost every, for every country in West Africa isn't, is among those 76 countries. What you call IDA, countries that have access to international development agency funding. But many of the countries in West Africa have different status in relation to the IDA funding. So Ghana, for example, is an IDA country like the rest of West Africa, but it is also an IBRD country, which means it is seen as slightly more advanced in terms of its economy and its in terms of credit worthiness. To it, so it has access to some of the more private sector tools that the International Bank for uh, in the, uh, the, uh, uh, IBRD, the, the Development Banking Wing, can provide. Okay, for that reason, it doesn't have the concessionary financing that, let's say, a country like Burkina Faso will have. It has a blend of both. Okay, and it will be eager on the one hand to gain what it can from the IDA, it will be eager not to lose access to the IBRD. I'm trying to say the debtors cartel, the debtors, the debtors country kind of unity in terms of their own regional policy, in terms of may itself be fragmented without popular pressure, which puts a basket of the needs, of minimum needs, a basket of minimum requirements in terms of public investment, a basket of, of minimum um, um, interventions in terms of seeding back policy control over money, over money, over tax, over financing, and so on and so forth. Those, that is the agenda that among us as civil society, as activists, as trade unions, and so on, we should be developing and seeking to unify and, and, and give coherence to whether you're in the global north or in the global south. Because even though I agree with all the calls for cancellation, suspension, and I think they should go even further, and I will support the governments who say so, I'm simply saying that they are not as, as consistent and as reliable allies in this fight as we can think about. You know, it's, there's class issues involved. There's ruling, you know, the ruling, ruling groups and the powerful uh, local financial interests may not be on the same side as you and I and, and, and others in Africa and so on. So we have to pop, go beyond the headline demands to actually posit demands that benefit real people on the ground. And, and, and one of the benefits of having a discussion like this is that it allows people, in whatever your locality, whatever the type of you know, economy that you live under, to begin to connect demands that may make sense in your own locality with others elsewhere. Because people in Britain, they may also be imperiled if you're in the gig economy. They may also be imperiled in terms of income support and you, I don't know what your welfare system is uh, uh, these days, or whether they can pay back their mortgages or, what, or, or whether, you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. you know, or whether they are, they are, they are, they are, the, the privatization of their pensions means that they will no longer gain in terms of you know, the defined uh, 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 contribution rather than defined benefit. Whichever way it is, if we are going to move away from business as usual, we are going to do so on a universal basis. In a universal basis that recognizes that we have to recognize the unevenness, we have to give affirmative action to the more vulnerable and so on and so forth, it still requires us to link the global with the local. It still requires yeah. ordinary people to see where their demands can make a difference. And it still requires them to see where their demands are so closely connected to where they live, how they work, such that they can exercise some power about, about how those demands are organized around, how they are advanced, how they are won, and so on. So I agree with these global demands. I'm simply saying that they should also have a view to transforming Africa's position and the okay. global South position in these international policy decision-making arenas, in the okay. character of the policies themselves, and in the kind of resilient uh, you know, uh, uh, developmental aspects okay. of our economies that we require to, to, to finance our own de uh, 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 development by and large, to ensure that, you know, health workers get what they need in terms of their pay, in terms of their protection, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you find these anomalies all over the place. I'll give you one last example. Botswana, for example, okay? You have a situation where insurance companies in Botswana, which are usually multinational insurance companies, refuse to insure frontline health workers in the COVID-19 because they say it's an act of God. It's an act of God, so we cannot insure you. Now, unless public authorities, public policy, public resources, public institutions step into it and compel, you know, or provide the insurance themselves or compel, it won't happen. Which means that public mobilization and public claims on what resources should be used for, what type of decisions should be made, who should be catered for, how we unify, you know, the different needs of our different sections of our population, an absolute requirement everywhere. We need the same thing, some of the same things that you need, more PPEs, more tests, and so on. But we also need a minimum basket of food, of ensuring that transport is organized, there's distribution, there's medicines, and so on. And all those things can be done, and be some of, a lot of this can be started immediately mm -hmm. locally, 
even if governments have constrained resources, because we all know that finance depends on claims in the future. Okay. Governments Jay can raise money. Jechi, I would need to stop future. you again. Sure, <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Um, sure. No I know that, I mean, when Jechi started talking, he, uh, it, it's, which he, he has a lot to say and he can actually talk for three hours if you will let him. But no, um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm those honest, are I'm really, really, really that, important. But I, I, I just tried to connect the global with yeah. the local. Those are really, really important points. And also you have given us a lot of um, ideas as well, where to start and how what is needed to to start mobilizing and what to demand and all this stuff, which I think um, our our participants are highly appreciative of. Uh, I was just reminded by Sam that uh, we actually need to end by eight because in my mind I was I was reverting back to the two hour uh, webinar time slot. Um, so I would like to do uh, at least one more round and and um, there are a lot of questions, but. Some of the questions, I, I think these are all recorded here and some of you have, have um, also left your email address so that the, the panelists can address them uh, personally as well in, in, in some other time. But I, I would just wanted to may, maybe uh, pick three more questions. And um, well, again, to team, uh, it's, it's on the question of how do we push, how do we make sure that uh, this tax will happen um, and also, um, on, I, I don't know who can answer, but maybe anyone can, can respond to this. Um, how far are the conditions in bilateral trade deals between individual countries? Um, and at the same time, there's also a question on, um, directed to Miriam. What do you think of Kate Roward's donut theory? Uh, this is also another, um, alternative that, um, a lot of people in the progressive movements are, are in favor of. And then maybe last would be on, well, maybe the back end would be too long. We'll, we'll try to have another discussion on, on that. Um, Should I quickly say something on bilateral trade deals and then the question mm -hmm. of, uh, I mean, basically, I mean, the, this is a problem because it, the, it's fixing, you know, what governments cannot do, basically. Um, so it's basically what Cheche said, that they want to have back us what he calls policy space and the way that you can impose your conditions are being restricted by this, those trade deals. It restricts to what you can uh, import. Um, you even not are able to export your... Uh, and to tax your exports. Indonesia, for instance, wants to do that because it says, I want to tax my raw materials so that I, it's cheaper when you export the value added and then some workers have been able to gain some, some of it, hopefully, or at least something remains in the country if it's well organized. Um, but that also people don't know, but the trade agreements very often have trade in services, which include financial services. And there, there is an obligation to let those foreign players to come in um, and also to allow money to go in and out. That's as a condition very often also in the investment agreements. You have to allow quite some of the money to go in and out, depending on how strong you have been negotiating. So it does have an influence on uh, what is happening, how you can get an income. And don't forget trade deals mean tariff cuts, which means less tax for the, for the government. That's very often forgotten. Um, yes, it, so it does play an important role and that's something that has to be reviewed because trade has to have the purpose of, well, let's say very in kind of very broad terms, sustainable, de sustainable development. And for the moment, it's just free trade and uh, the, the, the companies have the rights and the consumers and the countries have very little rights to, to kind of claim back. Secondly, um, I, when the Kate Roward's donut theory, I think it's extremely important that we bring all these alternatives there and really think differently what she has been able to do. I must say, I've, I had, it's not a bit time I have read it, but I think it's important that we also think, how are we going to finance it? And how are we therefore going to change finance? Um, you know, because public banks is one of the but others are saying yes, but probably you, know, you cannot always trust every government. So there are other ways to uh, make sure that uh, you can finance it. Um, so I always call for diversity of the banking sector, closing all the speculators so that there is not, not money to be made there. Um, and there's lots of conditions to be put, uh, tax havens to be closed, etc. So yeah, I, I think those two have to come together to be short.
Thanks. Team? Um, I don't think I have much to add on those um, questions. I could add a little bit more on the question about the credit ratings. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd point to an example like Argentina. So Argentina defaulted on its debt in 2002 and then had a long period over 10 years where it agreed with most of its uh, creditors to pay uh, about 33% of the debt, but a few vulture funds kept suing them and um, nice that followed through. <laughs> And eventually the new government came in in Argentina a few years ago and paid off the vulture funds. And as soon as they did that, all the private speculators completely forgot about the um, payment troubles of the last 10 years and were willing to lend like anything to Argentina. And the um, right wing government borrowed a huge amount. And unsurprisingly, um, Argentina a couple of years ago and um, went back into a debt crisis. So um, I, I would defer to Jeche on um, his views on this, but some things I would point out is I think um, governments are very concerned about their credit ratings. Actually, if you stop paying your debt to private lenders, they're not going to lend to you at that point in time. But actually, um, once the situation is resolved, they tend to lend very easily and quickly, um, a lot more than you would expect. But also to the question is how much use is that foreign lending? Certainly government borrowing and investment is vital. And that if it can be borrowed and well used, that's really useful. But a lot of the time, uh, maybe um, borrowing resources domestically can be um, more use. There isn't so much evidence of how useful high interest loans from private speculators actually are um, in um, getting the investments that countries need. Absolutely right, Tim. Um, yes, you're perfectly right on, on that last point. But I think that um, in terms of the questions, uh, can, can I ask, do, can, can we write responses to, to them later? I mean, there are lots yeah, of questions. You, yeah, I think this, they're, they're, all, they're yeah. all important, but the value of staying at the level of the aggregate, okay. at the big picture level now, is that we gain a better understanding of what drives what and who is doing the driving and who gains, who loses. You know, and, 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 that, and that's why the, the systemic questions around debt around finance, around international trade agreements and so on, are important as a starting point for framing and interconnecting the different aspects. Okay, so I, I would rather I start to that level now, at the level of, you know, and then maybe respond to the more detailed questions a bit later if there's an opportunity to okay. do so. But yes. someone talked about, uh, you know, free trade agreements and so on. And I think, again, those are very important, okay? Because we all know that, um, for example, if you take pharmaceuticals, this is one of the things that, uh, the former leader of the Labour Party, um, um, Jeremy Corbyn, was, you know, so passionate about, about the power of pharma big pharmaceutical companies, transnational companies, and their intellectual property rights to actually, you know, distort the, not, not simply the market for health in the world, but health services and, and so on. And you find that in this case as well, okay, precisely because of the fact that, you know, the, 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 these trade agreements and the, and the power and pressure of the big governments which are behind the big companies have been brought to bear to, to, di to di disable developing countries, countries from the global south, from being able to develop autonomous, independent pharmaceutical industries. You have a lot of crisis going on. If you take um, um, this COVID-19, a lot of the modeling suggests that a lot of people who might die from it will not necessarily die from COVID-19 directly. They will die from associated crisis. For example, those who are, have t TB already, t tuberculosis, those who have HIV and so on. And already we find that those countries that have not exploited whatever leeway they have to develop the generic versions of antiretroviral drugs, they are crisis right now. In Ghana, you go to hospitals now where there are children who are HIV positive, who are dependent on ARVs, and you get antiquated tablets being given to them now, things that were in the stores that no one else takes anywhere in the world anymore. They've been brought out, they are being given to people. A single tablet can be split into six or eight portions, given to a child, even if it's expired, it passes expiry date, God knows, and so on. And you find a multiplicity of crises like this. You know, other respiratory diseases, uh, 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 bronchitis, 
tuberculosis and so on. And, and, and the malnourishment that poverty and the, the, the increasing incidence of poverty will cause will, will actually aggravate the situation as well. In the global financial and economic crisis in 2008, thereabouts, okay, Africa lost a quarter of its total uh, uh, gross national income because it is so trade dependent. It is so dependent on export. So when the export markets closed, fully a quarter of the African economy and the value created was lost. Now it will be much higher because it's a lot more integrated and have a lot more uh, variety of, of, of different levels. 82 million people went into poverty within that one year in Africa, including people who became malnourished and so on. So the crisis that we are talking about right now and its potential knock-on effects requires us to understand that giving people that minimum basket of food supplies, ensuring that local supplies can be given to those who need it, that governments can ramp up expenditure, domestic expenditure in their own local money to ensure that some of these uh, things take place, to ensure that health supplies are available, health personnel are paid, vitally important. And that requires us to actually suspend or abolish or roll back a lot of the provisions that international trade and investment agreements have. In provisions around intellectual property, provisions around financial services and other services such as Miriam was talking about, provisions around food, around industry, and, and around transport and so on and so forth. I think it's critical to do so now. In Europe, there's a renegotiation of the, uh, the, 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 the foundational economic association agreements with its former colonies in Africa, the Pacific and the Cari Caribbean underway. It's supposed to have actually concluded later this year, okay? In Britain itself, post-Brexit, you know that there has been this push, ongoing push to have this so-called empire 2.0, some form of new generation trade agreements with, uh, you know, uh, countries in, in Africa and so on. And I think that a lot of, a new generation of a lot of these threats that are already imminent and present in uh, uh, you know, free trade agreements will likely bring themselves back, especially now that companies, big companies and big countries are competing with one another to actually grab shares of, of the global market and, and so on. So vigilance on these questions, and I'm very glad that Global Justice Now has always maintained a consistent engagement and a consistent you know, mm -hmm. you know, forward-looking advo advocacy around that. Vigilance on these questions of trade and investment, vigilance on the questions of debt and finance, vigilance on the systemic issues that in terms of that governed trade, finance, and investment, as well as the system aspect, the systemic aspects of people's livelihood, their transport needs, their food needs, their health needs, the public investments that sustain them, and so on and so forth. I think all those things added together offer us the, the, the elements of a platform that we need to develop rapidly, fairly rapidly, as quickly as Miriam has proposed her you know, corona tax. We also need to develop a broader platform. And I think that broader platform is what can keep, allow us together to keep developing our work going forward you know, in terms of the big picture, and as well as you know, uh, 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 you know, address the specific interests and the specific points of entry that individuals may have in terms of what they want to do, what they, mm -hmm. they think they can add in terms of solidarity, what they can, what, you know, the interests that they have in terms of developing a, a deeper understandings, interconnecting our different experiences, sharing and learning together. We need a mm -hmm. broad platform to be able to do that, okay. and I hope the things that uh, the, the the subsequent talks that you have every fortnight will be. Partly, mm -hmm. you know, oriented around developing that platform mm -hmm. and deepening that platform. Yeah. Thank yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid that we're running out of time. Um, there's still a lot of questions that I'm really sorry that we won't be able to respond to. But actually, you're giving us ideas of the next topic that we can do in the forthcoming podcast. So also this one and the first webinar the last webinar that we did will be in our website it will be it will be um it will go out as a pod podcast on friday and this one as well uh, pretty soon so stay stay tuned with our website um and uh, to look at the link and and see the recording also of of this webinar so i just wanted to thank all our speakers uh, once again you have given us a lot of 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 uh, really meaningful ideas and excellent uh, uh, actions and plans to take. And I hope that everyone will join uh, the, the, um, the, the campaign on Twitter and social media, and then also if there's a possibility to join that meeting. So uh, Sam is putting all the links on the right side again. And I hope that you will join us again um, on April 23 for the next webinar, um, which will be focused on uh, women in the front line. So how is the coronavirus pandemic impacting on women? And we have speakers uh, from the Philippines and from South Africa to discuss that, uh, both national and regional impacts. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. 
and um, the time will be at 1 p.m. So Sam reminded me that it is in a different time slot. So it will be at 1 p.m. Um, because we might have a speaker from Latin America as well. So we're trying to, to uh, fit together three continental time slots in that schedule. So we will, we will post the invitation for everyone. And um, again, thank you for joining us and thank you to our wonderful panel of speakers. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you, everyone. Yeah, bye, thank you.